And last week, we talked about a bit of a touchy subject. What did we talk about last week? Tithing. So, I have another little, uh, a little twist on this as, as such. All right. What do you do when one spouse wants to do what's right and wants to tithe and the other spouse does not? All right. So there we're in, in a... It can, can be a little bit of a, a quandary there when one does and one does not. And, and there are really a, a few factors that could, that could play into this, all right? First of all, one of, one of the partners, one of, one of the spouses might be saved and the other one is not. Or possibly one of one, uh, the spouses is wanting to do what's right and, and the other one has, is in a backslidden state, all right? And also other factors that, that can affect it a little bit are which one is it that wants to tithe? Is it the husband or is it the wife? All right? And also, another factor is how do you handle your personal finances now? Okay? And I'm going to show you how these things all play into um, some kind of advice that I could maybe give you. All right? But we're going to look at, at several Bible principles and, and how they, they, they work into this. All right? So the, the first thing that, that I'd, I'd like to, to look at, because this is clearly not an ideal situation, all right? The ideal situation is husband and wife both love the Lord, they both want to do what's right, and they want to, so they're, they're, they're going to tithe, okay? And, and get that initial, as, as I told you last week, if, if we can't get the, the initial part of, of giving back to God what belongs to God, then most of the rest of what I'm going to tell you is, is, is going to be a, a, a moot point. All right. It is important that we start off on the right foot, although it's only 10% okay, of what we bring in. And the other 90%, God allows us the choice of what to do with, and I think some of that should also go back to God. All right. But at, this, at the same time here, if we start off with the wrong 10% to begin with, we, we, we lose track the rest of the way along. All right. <clears throat> so principle number one, okay, or... or Situation number one, let, let me ask you this. Does a unsaved person need to tithe? Does an unsaved person need to tithe? Give me some thoughts on this. Brother Ian? I would say no, because that's the least of their problems. <laughs> okay, all right. Somebody else? Any, any other thoughts? Brother Wayne? Okay, all right. Does God require an unsaved person to tithe? Any other thoughts? Brother Ian, you already had a thought. I know, but I, believe it or not, I have a second thought. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I have to sit down for a minute. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, once you've recovered. Um, Abraham didn't tithe. Because that could collapse the battle. But just using that as a Um, we see the first, we see Abraham, to, just to correct you a little bit here, just because we, we only hear of him tithing after the battle of Melchizedek does not mean that he was not tithing before that. <laughs> okay, the one, doesn't, the one doesn't eliminate the other necessary. Deb. Okay. All right. Linda? Um, you, if anything that comes in, you, you, are you should tithe on. Okay, re require, like, there isn't, there isn't a requirement, the, the only requirement is you are getting something, so you need to give back to God. Whether you are on a pension or, uh, or someone is, if, it, here's a little, little, little offside question here, if someone gives you a gift, should you tithe on it? How about an inheritance? Should you tithe on it? 
okay? It's all part of our increase, all right? And it's all part of God's blessings to us. So we need to, no matter what, what we get, all right, if God is blessing us with that, we should give back to God, all right? Because it all comes from him, all right? Take your Bibles first. Let's, let's, I'm going to look at something here. I want you to turn to John chapter 3, familiar passage. I'm going to start in verse 16, familiar verse. John 3.16 says what? Say it out loud for me. Verse 17. And verse 18. Let's read that together. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. All right? The bigger issue here, as Ian pointed out in his first thought, which was more accurate than his second thought, <laughs> is, is salvation. All right? And as, as, as we look at that, if, if, I'm, I'm just going to read this verse to you. I read it to you last week. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Let me ask you this. An unsaved person has rejected God's Son. Is God going to bless them because they give them, because they give them some money? When you think of it that way? Now, let, 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 me, let me just put a little proviso on, on where my, my thought pattern is going here. I think that if a, if a person is seeking God, they aren't saved, and they, they take this, they go to Malachi verse, and, they, and, and, and God says here, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If they are doing this to find out if really there is a God, not to try to pull this magic trick out of the hat so that I become rich here, but, but doing this, God, are you really real? And, and, do the, then I, and then I think that God will bless them, okay? But I really wonder if, again, as I, we, we talked about it a couple of weeks back, there are, they should tithe. I, I believe it is a universal principle that, that everybody should tithe because everything we get comes from him, all right? But does God hold them accountable for that? I think that it really kind of lines up a lot more closely to where we looked at with the Philistines moving the Ark of the Covenant. Did they move the Ark of the Covenant in the correct way? No. Really, what they should have done, okay, what they really should have done was said, you know what, we don't want this Ark of God. We're going to send some ambassadors into Israel and say, bring us four of your Levites and carry this thing out of here and take it out. Okay, if they knew that, all right, that would, that would be the correct way. But God allowed them to do something else. Because, but when the, when the people tried to do that same thing, God killed Uzzah, all right, because those that are God's people, not just those that know better, they didn't, I don't think that they knew better. I, I think some, something was missing there, and, and, and they didn't realize that they absolutely had to carry it all with, on four Levites, all right. And God's, that, that didn't, ignorance did not matter here, all right? But because they were God's people, they're held to a higher standard. And I believe that the same with, with tithing, although it, it is a universal principle, I believe that, that everybody should be tithing. I don't think that it's, it, it's quite the same thing. It's, it's not the same thing if a, if a Christian doesn't tithe and a non-Christian doesn't tithe, okay? Um, like Ian said to begin with, there's, there's bigger things at stake here. Salvation is, is a bigger item than the tithing, all right? But keep keeping that in mind, and, and, and that's, that's somewhat subjective, and, and you, may, you may disagree with me, and I may be wrong here, okay? But I'm, I want to show you how this, how this kind of plays out, all right? So the bigger situation, like I said, is clearly salvation here, all right? So the first consideration we need to, need to think of as we look at this, this thing here is, are, they re, are, are the unsaved really required to tithe before God? Okay. When um, 
Moving on to the second consideration. There's about five of them. We'll put them together, okay? When Lenore and I first got married, we, uh, we, we decided what we're going to do is, this is how much our bills are going to be. So we had opened a third bank account as such. So she had her bank account, and I had my bank account, and then we opened a third bank account, and then we both put in X number of dollars every week into this particular bank account so that we could pay all the bills out of that account. And then she, would, she could keep her money, and I could keep my money, and we did that for a year, all right? And at the end of the year, we examined how that worked, and uh, we changed the way things worked, all right? I'm not, not gonna get into that, that detail, but, uh, but a lot of people, do a very similar thing to that, where they would, the, the wife has her money, the husband has his money, they pool together, and they pay their bills out of, out of that part there, all right? Take your Bibles, go to, with me to Genesis chapter 2 in verse number 24. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24 says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be, what? One flesh. All right? They shall be one flesh. Now, you know what? I could read you a very similar, the exact same thing quoted by Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, in Mark chapter 10, and Paul mentions the same thing almost word for word, but this exact same principle in Ephesians chapter 5. You leave your father and mother, you cling together, and you will become one flesh, all right? When you're married, you are not roommates, <laughs> okay? You're not two separate people coming together under one roof and, and doing the things and, and combining things as such, you know? It, you are one flesh, you are one family. There needs to be, everything needs to come into, should come into the same pot, all right? Now, do, does that mean you can't have some spending money of your own? No, I don't believe that at all, okay? Like, I, I believe that you, know, you, can ha you can have a little bit of spending money and you both have a little bit. We, we do, we've done that forever, where almost like an allowance as such, and uh, I would get some money, and then and Lenore would get some money, and it's out of that money that I'm going to buy her her gifts, okay? So when I buy her a gift, it is from me, not from us, <laughs> all right? Not that those, because if this is a really big thing that we both want, then it's a gift from us to us, okay? But <laughs> at, at any rate, the, the, the point is you can have some money of your own, okay? But everything comes in, first of all, into one central spot. Okay, one central spot. So, all right, this means if, just, just throwing you one little twist here, all right, if the couple is one of these people that keeps their money, their money, our money, okay, and one of these people wants a tithe and the other one does not, it's real simple. You tithe off of yours for now before it goes into the pot, okay? Because this is the one that is saved or is, is trying to do what's right. You need to do that, what's right, okay? You tithe off of everything that you bring in before you put it into the pot altogether, all right? And the unsaved person or the backslidden person, they're going to have to answer doc to God, okay, for what, what they're doing there. But the first thing to do here is it, your, your money needs to come together into one thing, because we're one, all right? We're one. Principle number three here. Who is responsible for the pot? Who is responsible for the pot? Are you jointly responsible for the pot? Is the wife responsible for the pot? Is the husband responsible for the pot? What think ye, my friends? Joe. He's the head of the house. Would you uh, read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23? Someone look that up for me. Ephesians chapter 5. Everybody look it up. Follow along. Ephesians 5, 23. We're going to touch on some things that the pastor has been talking on lately, and I'm just going to, not changing anything that he's done by any means, we're just going to have another application to, to his, his things that he has been teaching 
through, uh, through Peter and, and also in, in touching in some of these other things here. But in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Okay? The husband is the one who is responsible for the pot. Does that mean that he has to pay all the bills? What do you think? Brother Art? Yes, I do. So we had that. I got three separate accounts. I paid so much in here, so much to there, and I worked on the budget. First of all, the Lord's first, and then that prayer and hope. And we both get each other to be in here. Okay. It's a good all to get it. She, she wants some, I get it. If I want some, I get it. I have a, a, a three different ledgers. Okay. So exactly what's in every ledger, and I bring it down once a month, I bring the ledger bill. Because one is for the bills, one is one is for my checks, and one is for another another check that goes in there. So the Lord has given me I got four different pensions. So I gotta take three different bank accounts and keep everything in the right perspective, and then I balance it all out at the end of the month. Okay. But I'm, not, I'm not, not into how we do this right now. I want to know, does the husband have to pay all those bills? Is he responsible for that? He is responsible. Let, let, me, let me put it this way. You know, if, if the wife is better at finding better deals, at better at um, self-control and not spending all the money, all right, or better at, better at the numbers, okay, then, you know what? It would be wise for the husband to say, okay, well, you, to delegate some responsibility to that way, okay? But hear, but hear, hear this, all right? After the husband delegates the responsibility, if the bills don't get paid, whose fault is it? It's the husband's fault. Even if the wife doesn't pay that bill, it's the husband's fault, all right? If the wife doesn't tithe, you know what? The husband is robbing God because he delegated that, but he has to make sure that that is, is being done. But it doesn't mean that he has to do all that, all right? It, it you know, <clears throat> if in the case that the, uh, the husband and wife have at least this portion of the way that it should be, set up, all right, to where the husband is, is, is the one who is ultimately responsible for it. And the husband is the one who wants to tithe. And all the money is coming together into one point, one pot. Then I believe that the husband should be the one to make sure that the tithe is coming from both people, regardless of whether his wife is saved or not, if it's coming all together into that one pot, then the husband should be making sure that everything is tithed from. Okay? It gets a little bit more different when it's the wife who wants to tithe and puts it in and, and, and the husband is the one who does not. And we're going to look at some other principles that, that affect that. But I really believe that although, you know, we, <clears throat> that, that at, at that point, okay, if, if they're following this one principle that the, the husband is the head of the home and the husband is the one who is responsible ultimately for where those bills go, then he should tithe from both of the incomes. All right? You follow me on that? Principle number four. Who is the most important person in your life? God needs to be number one to start with. But people-wise, who is the most important person in your life? Pardon me? It should be your spouse. It should be your spouse. Let's take a look at, at a couple of verses here, all right? We looked at, I, I read the one from Genesis chapter 2, 
I mentioned one about Matthew chapter 19. I mentioned Mark chapter 10. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 31. Same verse, again, okay? But this is what Paul is saying. He says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. All right? They shall be one, and that's who needs to be. Not only are you one, you needs to be number one. All right? We see that in, in um, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 19, we are commended, we are told, husbands, love your wives. Okay? It is a command. Now, I've heard people preach and say, well, yeah, the husbands are commanded to, to love their wives, but nowhere does it command the wives to love their wives or love their husbands. <laughs> Let me get this straight here, all right? <laughs> Okay, I don't care what they're doing in Toronto. We're going to get it right here, okay? But uh, it does, all right? In Titus, Paul tells Titus, he, you know, when he writes to Titus, he says, exhort the older women that they will teach the younger women to do what? To love their husbands. And it is vitally important that the very most important person, your favorite person, the closest person to you needs to be your spouse. It has to be. Now, if you are single, then that person should be your assistant pastor. All right? No. Just kidding. All right? Pastor says, wait a minute. <laughs> no, he didn't. All right? But <laughs> we're going to have a wrestling match in church. All right? No. Okay? But that, that needs to be, it needs to be that way. All right? And, and if, it, if things, I want you to look, look at it this way. If things are done in the right order, which they aren't always done in the right order, but the right order is you get married, then you have children, and then they get married and leave and cleave under their own wives, and they leave the house, all right? So you know what? That spouse is somebody you have before you have kids. That spouse is somebody you have after they are gone. They need to be the most important person in your life. And I'm going I'm to candy coat this as best way as I can. You ready for this? If your spouse is not your closest, most favorite, most important person in your life, then you are out of the will of God. How's that for candy coating? All right? That's, that's what, it, what it needs to be. If, if, we, if we mess up the order, okay, if, if, if we mess up how God sets things down, we can't help but go in the wrong direction. All right? And, and, it, and it needs to be that. But let me, let me tell you, let me ask you this. If this person truly is the most important person in your life, and whether it's, whether it's in a case of, of they don't know the Lord as their Savior, or if it's a case that they are backslidden, and, and, and their relationship with God is not what it ought to be, you know what? This burden should be more than just a simple prayer request that you ask for help for. This needs to be something that is on your heart. Because this person is that close to you, all right? And it takes us to principle number five, okay? Principle number five. I want you to take your Bibles. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. First Corinthians chapter 7. Actually, and then I want you to... Hold your finger in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and then, and then go over with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. All right? Just so you got both there. I was, I was going to do a, a, a Pastor Hudson thing here and get you to turn to 1 Peter 3 and I was going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, but I forgot. So <laughs> here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 16 says, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Now here it's talking about, about separating and, and, and staying together and the reason to stay together. Now go over me, with me, if you will, please, to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1. It says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Verse 2, While they behold your chaste conversation, Coupled with fear. And Pastor touched on this. Conversation is not just what we say. It, it includes what we say. But it is what we do, all right? 
in if you if you're in first peter chapter 3 just go back to first peter chapter 2 look at verse 12 it says having your conversation honest among the gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evildoers they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify god in the day of visitation your good works is your conversation okay it is what you do it is the the actions that we do let me read for you james chapter 3 and verse 13 it says, who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. It's, it's what you do. That's what it's talking about when it says your conversation. It's, it's how you act. It's, it's what is really you, all right? Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Let me just read this one for you. You can look it up if you want. But it says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Again, talking about the conversation, it's what we do, all right? It's, it's how we act. It's, 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 it is includes the things that we say, but how we say them, all right? And, and, and exactly what we're doing. Conversation is our works in action, all right? It's our works in action. Your spouse, whether saved or unsaved, whether backslidden or not backslidden, gets to see you at your worst. Right? They might see you at your best, but they definitely see you at your worst. And your prayer needs, and, 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 and your desire needs to be such that this person whom you love more than any other will come to God or will come back to God depending on which situation they're in, whether they're saved and, or, and, and backslidden or whether they never were saved at, at all. And we're in a situation and that can happen a number of ways. It can, it can be two end people, unsaved people that, gets, that get married and then one of them gets saved and then we've got something or the, there's one person who's, who's unsaved can marry a, a saved person and, and, and complicate things right from the get-go, all right? But it needs to be our, your prayer and your heart's desire that that person would come back and needs to be one to the Lord, as it says there in 1 Peter chapter 3, all right? Where's that verse here? Sorry. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if they obey not the word... They also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. If constant preaching at them's not going to do it, okay? They're at a point where that, 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 that's not, they, they've heard it, and, and, they're, and, and they're not going to listen anymore. But they have to see it in action, all right? And they have to see it in action from the one who cares about them the very most in the world, all right? And it needs to be that way, you know? And so here, here's my advice to the wife that wants to tithe, but her husband is, is in that other category of either unsaved or saved and does not want to tithe. And if it's coming, and if, if your funds are, are, are being put together, all right, to where they're coming together, which is, which is the right way. But it, it, it's complicated here now because it's the wife. But here's, here would be my advice. Is that you sit down and you talk with your spouse about your desire to do things right. To tithe on your portion. Not his portion that he brings in. But say that you want to tithe on the portion that you are bringing in, because are they required? Maybe, maybe not. Again, I could be wrong there. But at, at any rate, he's responsible for what, what that, that, is, that is coming in, all right? So that you would, you would talk and say, I, I, would, I, I want to tithe on the portion that I'm bringing in, but here's it. Here, here's the thing. And be prepared to make the sacrifices to make that happen. Not him. 
but those sacrifices come from you. If, if you do like what Lenore and I do and there's a certain amount that it's, it's you're spending money, that goes towards your tithe. All right? Or if there's, there's some certain things that, that you like to do and you like to have, you give those things up so that there is the money there that you can tithe. And you show that husband that you care about who is the most important person on the planet to you ahead of your kids. So many people put their kids ahead of their spouse. You can't do that. Your spouse needs to come ahead of your kids. We made sure that our, our children understood that right from the get-go. I love mom. She comes before you. And they have nothing but the absolute respect for her. And I believe that is part of it. Okay? But to show that, 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 that you be willing to sacrifice to whatever you need to give up in order to make that possible not, so that he's not sacrificing that. That would be my advice to you. Because what are you trying to do? Trying to win that person back to or to the Lord to begin with. All right? Money set aside. We're talking a soul here. We're talking an eternal soul. And if that person doesn't know Christ as a Savior, doing whatever you can and showing whatever you can from your heart, even you giving up, saying, this, this is how important God is to me. Okay? I'm going to show you, I'm going to live for you how important God is, how important he is and how important he is to me. And to prove that with, this, with the sacrifice that you are willing to make in order to do what you need to do. And that is to give God back what belongs to God. It could be extra clothes that you would get. It could even be, I'm going to work extra hours. Then your tithe has to be more because you made more, but nonetheless, all right? The, the, the point is this. The, 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 whole, the whole thing is this. How much do we really desire to do things God's way? Or do we only want to somehow get God's blessing without going through God's order. God says, let all things be done decently and in order. All right? And he has order for things. He has order, as, as pastor has been preaching, and if you haven't heard them, get the tapes. Or, or you know, there's no tapes. <laughs> they even have cassette tapes anymore. Okay, but you can look them up online of how, how to, to get things in order for the, for the family and what that is, all right? And in order to, to get things in order for our finances, we need to do the same thing. There, there's, there's basic principles. There's basic principles in life of, that God has set down for us that we need to have those principles in order, okay? In order to see how God will work, all right? And that about covers the first 10%. And we'll look at the other 90 as, as, we, as we move on. But here's my question for you. How important is God to you? How important is God to you? How important is your spouse to you? Even if you are both tithing and you're both wanting to do with God's will, look at this other portion of what we looked at. How important is that spouse to you? How much do you love them? Are they your best friend? They should be. If God can love me, we can love other people. <laughs> All right. And we, can, and we can love our spouse, and we need to. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Precious Father, we come before you, Lord. I thank you for your goodness.